Good morning and a warm welcome to our sixth service from Blackburn Presbyterian Church since the COVID-19 slowdown. Wherever you are viewing, we'd like to thank you for joining with us this morning. And we pray that you'll enjoy hearing the words of Jesus once again and hopefully his spirit will reach into every home and every heart as we worship him. If you'd like to leave a comment about the service on our Facebook page, we'd be delighted to be able to respond to you and thank you for, for tuning in. Today is the 26th of April. In Australia yesterday and in New Zealand, it was Anzac Day, a day commemorating the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, a time to remember those who were called to serve their nation in wartime and those who still serve and place themselves in harm's way at the call of the nation. So our opening prayer this morning, we're going to gratefully, gratefully acknowledge their service and their sacrifice. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the opportunity to call on your name. We know that there have been times gone by when people felt it was urgent to do so. And we recognize that we live and move and have our being in the world that you have given us. You are the creator of the ends of the earth. And as your creatures, we don't make a particularly good job of always living in peace and harmony. So we remember today that across our nation, there are homes that have been affected by war. Most often, quite a long time ago, in terms of living memory, but enough to disrupt home and family life for more than a generation. And so we pray for every home that has been touched by the loss and sacrifice that war has entailed for their loved ones. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you would speak comfort to every heart. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would unite us this morning, separate though we are, in purpose, that we might find your word entering and giving light to our lives. So hear us, and help us now by your Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our first scripture reading is from the prophet Isaiah, and I'm going to ask Christine to read that to us now. Thank you. Yes, and Sunday 6 of streaming, and before we began, I just said to Graham that every Sunday involves some new challenge. Whenever we think we're there, we're not quite. And thank you for all the input we're given. And I'm glad that last week, most of you had no trouble with the sound, but some people did. And we hope that next week, it will be better. I also thought as I sat watching, I should explain that the front of the church, the lights are dimmed, are actually off, because otherwise you won't see the slides. And we decided it's more important that you see the slides well than that you see us. Okay, so now to the Bible reading, which is Isaiah chapter 58. Verses 6 to 9. The whole chapter is actually entitled True Fasting, but I'm just reading this short portion of four verses. Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe him and not turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory 
of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. May God bless the reading of his word to all of us and to his name be the glory. Thanks, Christine. Our next reflection is going to be from the Psalms, from Psalm 82. When I was looking for a version of this psalm, I found it extremely difficult to find one because it's not sung a lot, which is a great pity. But eventually, uh, I found a version of it uh, sung by Henry Hafner and Nathan George of the Parish Presbyterian Church in Franklin, Tennessee. And I want to thank them for allowing me to use their music uh, this morning. And I hope you enjoy hearing the concerns that are voiced in Psalm 82, a psalm which, as you'll hear later, Jesus refers to at one particular point. Psalm 82 by Henry Hafner and Nathan George. Oops. That's all I'm not supposed to do. Three verses this time, 
from Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 to 18. And again, the heading in the New International Bible is fasting. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men that they are fasting. I tell you the truth. They have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father, who is unseen. And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Again, may God bless this reading to us and give us understanding. Thank you, Christine. Well, as you heard from that reading, the theme of this part of the Sermon on the Mount that we've reached in our studies is fasting. So I want to uh, introduce you to some thoughts on on fasting today. I've called it fasting in the slowdown because it seems to me that the pace of life has changed. Most of us uh, in the lockdown don't have very full diaries any longer and we're uh, viewing things and reading things that perhaps have been on our shelves for a while and trying to find an engagement with, uh, since we can't with people face to face uh, quite so easily as we did we're using electronic means. And you heard about my laptop crashing yesterday. So I'm relying on, a, on an iPad this morning. The image that I've chosen to go with this theme is this image of a, of a man in chains, on his knees, pleading. And around the outside of the image are these words, am I not a man and a brother? And this is a medallion that was published uh, in uh, 18, uh, 1786. I've put it on the cover of the church's leaflet uh, this week, which is available on the website, and you can download if you want to uh, pursue what I'm saying in the sermon itself. The sermon notes are, are there for you to read. But I want to connect the idea of fasting uh, with more than just food. It might begin there, but let's think about this for a minute. So, fasting in the slowdown is, is, our, is our theme. Australians will remember that when hand sanitizer and pasta disappeared from supermarket shelves and people were seen fighting over toilet rolls in the aisle, you might have been excused for thinking that we were living through times of great scarcity. But the government has patiently explained to us that in Australia we grow enough food for 75 million people. We could feed three times our population. We're a food exporting nation. Just think of this. One organization, Second Bite, rescued 19.4 million kilograms of food last financial year. That's enough for 38 million healthy meals. Australia has similar, several similar other organizations who are doing that same thing. Second Bite is just one of a half a dozen or more organizations. And they rescued that huge volume of food. From today's reading of the Sermon on the Mount, a unique question about food is raised. That question, quite simply, is not eating it. So what is fasting? Well, that's the first thing that we have to ask. And then we're going to move on to several other very simple questions. What? Why? When? And how? And if you were listening carefully to Christine's reading, you would have seen that the uh, question Jesus deals with, the question he answers, is not our first, second, or third question, but our fourth question is the question how. But we'll come to that in due course. The things that precede the how are things that his listeners knew about, uh, but we often don't know about living in the midst of such an abundance. So abstaining from food is called fasting. 
It's uncommon and unusual. We're used to seeing television shows with tense contestants struggling to display their superior ability to create palate-stimulating food for people who are not really hungry. And in the background, there is a larder and a pantry and a refrigerator stored with immense quantity of, uh, of food. Master Chef, My Kitchen Rules, they've dominated so much of our television. Alternatively, we may photograph and post on social media our own efforts at a gourmet presentation. <laughs> Maybe we might even do it for just a cup of coffee. Does that deserve a photo? It is a competition, right? Well, whoever thought of abstaining from food, who had fasting on their mind, on their agenda? Yet we know the word because every day we talk about breakfast, which is the meal that begins the day and breaks the night-long fast, breakfast. And some of our viewers might remember the 1975 introduction by World Vision of what they called the 40-hour famine. Participants were asked to fast for 40 hours, to deny themselves some other necessity, perhaps. Initially it was food, but it came to be screen time, or furniture, or sleep, or even talking. Imagine that. And being sponsored enabled participants to raise money and heighten their awareness of, and enable them to combat, in a small degree, world hunger. For many Australians, the 40-hour famine was their introduction to social engagement and concern. I should note in brackets here that there is an illness which entails an obsessive absence from food. That illness is anorexia nervosa. It's a condition which requires the attention of skilled medical practitioners and the earnest prayers of loving family. Anorexia turns the purpose of fasting in on itself. But what is the purpose of fasting? That's our question, why? In the Bible, fasting is deeply connected to a person's relationship with God. It's typically accompanied by looking back in sorrow, but looking forward prayerfully and hopefully. So it's connected with penitence, sorrow for the past, and hope for the future. Prayer and fasting are connected just as penitence and fasting are connected. In Israel, in the Old Testament, we have uh, the annual Day of Atonement, and that was a time of fasting for the nation. But the nation also celebrated with some of the great tragic events with fasting. The exile, for example, in 586 and the destruction of Jerusalem was a, a source, uh, an occasion for fasting in the lives of uh, many of the people of the Old Testament. In Jesus' day, devout people fasted regularly, even twice a week. Luke tells us this in chapter 18. But today, apart from a fasting blood test. When might a Christian fast? Well, that's our third question. When should a Christian fast? This question can be answered from Matthew's Gospel because Matthew records an incident which sheds light on this. Jesus was asked, the disciples of John the Baptist fast, but your, your disciples don't. Why is this? Why don't they fast? And Jesus uses the instance of a wedding feast. He says that one cannot fast while the bridegroom is present. At the wedding feast, Jesus' presence marks the dawn of a new day. Joy and celebration and feasting characterize his presence. But Jesus' disciples will fast, he says, when the bridegroom is taken from them. That's an important phrase. Initially, this might simply be thought of as meaning when Jesus was taken from the disciples for trial and execution. But we could add he was with them again from the resurrection, although he left them at the ascension. And yet Matthew tells us he's going to be with us always in Matthew 28. So we might wish to discuss this and imagine that it's a more complex issue, 
But it seems to me if there is a discussion about precisely what Jesus might have meant by his being taken away from them, it's clear that a sense of his absence might drive his disciples to fasting. In penitence, why have we lost your presence, Lord? Or in prayer, we need you to help us face the future. So the challenge facing the first Christians was enormous. They had to continue his work. They were to carry forward his ministry, which was so spectacular, so dramatic, and so joyful. And uh, we know from the book of Acts that they felt daunted at times, and that the, the believers' uh, prayers were sometimes accompanied by fasting. An interesting section there at the beginning of chapter 13 and chapter 14 of Acts, which tells us this as they appointed leaders and carried the mission of the church forward. In a hostile world, the work of Jesus was not easy to carry forward, to pursue God's will on earth as in heaven. Psalm 82, which we heard sung earlier, and uh, which Christine commented on, and I uh, must say I've enjoyed uh, the communication uh, with the uh, parish church in Tennessee uh, to... Uh, to uh, hear them singing that song is just amazing. The idea of God's will on earth. I encourage you to read Psalm 82. In fact, I encourage you to uh, look at Bono on Psalm 82 because there's a clip where he asks, why are there not more hymns like Psalm 82? It's, the psalm is about the abuse of power. You heard about the, about the widow, the fatherless, the, the, uh, those who are exploited. It's a, it's a condemnation of the leaders of the nations who are exploiting the people rather than nurturing and sustaining them. It's, it calls down uh, powerful leaders who abuse their power. Jesus had this psalm in mind in uh, John's Gospel chapter 10 and he quoted it when he faced a hostile crowd. Which of my good works do you condemn me for? And Isaiah expresses the fasting outcome that God is after. I printed it in the leaflet, you'll find it, it's, it's in the passage that Christine read. In the message it reads this way, God is speaking and says, This is the kind of fast day I'm after, to break the chains of injustice, to get rid of explo exploitation in the workplace, to free the oppressed, to cancel debts. What I'm interested in seeing you do is sharing your food with the hungry, inviting the homeless poor into your homes putting clothes on the shivering ill-clad and being available to your own families. And this is the task that Jesus has left his church with. It's his mission field. He said it in the synagogue at Nazareth in Luke chapter, Luke chapter 4. And he speaks to people who are being shaped by that in the Beatitudes. It won't be achieved by half-hearted believers and there are times when Christians looking back and looking forward passionately feel the need for God to act. Let me pick a particular example, the one connected with this image. John Wesley and George Whitfield were men credited with leading religious revivals and social transformation in the 18th century, both in Britain and America. They were also opponents of the slave trade, and both men were men of prayer and fasting. And they were in, in, uh, initiating a lot, what became a long struggle involving many people. Thomas Clarkson, Martha Gurney, Josiah Wedgwood, who used this image and had it uh, worn by ladies as brooches and, uh, and an insignia was you know, repeated many, many times, mass produced. Uh, William Fox and William Wilberforce, who's probably the best known name among them, they got together and they achieved the kind of God-desired fasting. The fasting that God wanted to see God's will coming on, on earth. We, we, uh, we saw the early church did this. In, in times of pandemic in Rome, the early Christians sought to pick up the unwanted from the streets, to care for the dying. They didn't flee the city in an epidemic. They sought to nurture its needs and its need. And this has happened when the church is at its best throughout history. The challenge of praying and pursuing God's will on earth remains enormous. I just think, for example, of the bounty we enjoy 
because of the enormous food security we have. But there are nations now coming into COVID-19 which have no food security. How do we feel about that? How do we as Christians in the land of plenty, having managed our COVID-19 challenge initially, relying on the immense resources of our community, the skills and the knowledge of doctors and medical people, researchers, food providers, essential services maintained, systems of government that hold together. We've been so blessed, but there are countries that are in a very ragged condition by comparison, and we need to be mindful of them at this time. How should we pass? Well, that's the question Jesus answers. This is exactly the question he brings before us in the passage Christine read. He tells us how we should fast. Just do it, he said, inconspicuously, calmly and quietly, without fanfare, so God only knows. In Jesus' day, the temptation was to parade your fasting, make it clear that you were in mourning for this or that. But Jesus says, no, it's about you and your relationship with your Heavenly Father. And it's that relationship that has to be at the heart of any effort that you make to be close to God and pursue His will on earth. It's not for the applause or admiration of others, but to displace idols, to assert anew what matters, and to enjoy renewed intimacy with God. What will the result be? Listen again as God speaking through Isaiah expresses it. What I'm interested in is seeing you do this, sharing your food with the hungry, inviting the homeless poor into your homes, putting clothes on the shivering ill-clad, being available to your own families. Do this, and the lights will turn on, and your, eye, your lives will turn around at once. Your righteousness will pave your way. The God of glory will secure your passage. Then when you pray, God will answer. You'll call out for help, and I'll say, Here I am. That's Emmanuel. We celebrated that idea at Christmas. And if we've felt an absence of God in our lives, this coronavirus is sweeping around the world and touching our country too, we need to ask ourselves, do we want to hear God say, Here I am. Let us pray. In our prayers, we have prayers of intercession and thanksgiving. And I'm going to close with the Lord's Prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the privilege of prayer, that unworthy as we are, we may come freely to you in Jesus' name, seeking to bear one another's burdens. Thank you that even in isolation, in a week of beautiful weather, we've heard of the flattening curve of infection and creative and good human generosity towards one another while socially isolated. We come as a community in Melbourne, grieving the needless loss of four police officers killed in the line of duty. We ask you to speak comfort to the hearts of those who love them and have mercy upon us. Lord, we pray for the elderly and those with compromised health, that they might be kept safe from COVID-19, and that despite social isolation, they might be reassured by the love and care of families and neighbours. Lord, we pray again for our Prime Minister and the National Cabinet. As they guide the nation through these critical days, may good counsel, wisdom and harmony prevail. Lord, we ask you to protect medical staff from harm as they care for the sick. Please work healing through them. Grant that Medical trials may quickly yield encouraging results as scientists search for treatments, prevention, and a cure. Comfort all young and the elderly who have lost loved ones to COVID-19, especially with the enforced loneliness of their passing. May they find solace in your abiding presence. Bring calm and kindness 
wherever communities are fearful, by good neighbours as angels known and unknown, encourage those distressed by loss of work and income, strengthen every family, busy working from home, and with the added challenge, perhaps, of children on remote learning. Grant to local, state, national and transnational agencies a desire to work together to overcome this pandemic. Help the poorer nations. As coronavirus reaches them, may they receive all the help they desperately need. Remind us once again of how we can love one another as you have loved us. May the Spirit of Christ reign in our hearts and minds. Let us unite together as Jesus has encouraged us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. The benediction. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit rest upon and remain with each one of us today and always.